Wimbledon's loss is our gain. So let's move on to the business of uh, today. In fact, uh, Jay wants to give a six-minute uh, talk, I think, at the end of this. So please stop me and stop us at um, six minutes to the hour, I think. Um, you want to give a talk on our little bit of presentation on um, your, your event coming up in 2014. So it gives me great pleasure again to introduce the panelists on this, uh, on this wonderful uh, occasion of the Jayton P. Shaw lecture, or panel. Uh, I'll be the moderator, of course. Now, Doug Evans called me last night and uh, called, called Greg Randolph, in fact, and he can't be here because of uh, weather conditions. So we've enlisted Claudio Cernea, who's on my immediate left from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, a well-respected head and neck surgeon and thyroid oncologist. On my far left is uh, Greg Randolph, who we all know from Harvard University. On my far right is Lauren Rothstein, a highly respected and well-received well colleague in uh, Toronto. And uh, immediate to the right of me is um, Brian McIver, who is a surgical endocrinologist, I might say, from the uh, Mayo Clinic and has been my good friend for how long, 20 years or so? Yeah. So uh, I think this is an auspicious panel. So the, the format is going to be um, uh, case presentations, and what I'd like to do is, is uh, touch on a lot of controversy or controversial features in the management of head and neck uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, you can see the list as well as I can, so uh, I, I have no delusion. Diagnostic, but, if, but if it is diagnostic, it's helpful. But even if it's non-diagnostic, the microcalcification to me is a relative indication for at least a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy. I recognize that it's six millimeters. I recognize that you could do this now or you could do it later, but I, I think this man is going to end up with a recommendation for a hemi. Okay, Brian, any other, th other thoughts on that? So if we read the American Thyroid Association guidelines, uh, it's suggested that not only do we take the ultrasound features into account and the size into account, but we also take the patient into account, and I think it's reasonable. This is a guy who is at low risk for thyroid cancer. Um, we haven't heard about radiation exposure, but we're presuming he's not been radiation exposed. Similarly, family history is really important to elicit. And if the, there is a family history or radiation exposure history, then the guidelines would suggest you can start biopsying as small as five millimeters. Um, for those who don't have those features and all you have is the ultrasound appearance, the ATA guidelines say don't biopsy unless it's greater than a centimeter. Now, of course, with the stippled calcifications, I think the likelihood of malignancy is that much higher. This is likely to be a papillary microcancer, but a papillary microcancer of this sort can safely be observed. And uh, Ito's very revolutionary work in Japan suggests that only a minority of those will come to surgery over the next few years. So I think it would be perfectly safe to simply monitor that uh, papillary microcancer that we think it probably is, um, but still look into the reason he's got throat pain. So I'm interested to know what's causing his symptoms. Extensive investigation revealed nothing. Okay, uh, Greg, any other thoughts? I would say this certainly could be, with the data we have, a papillary microcarcinoma. I think I agree with Brian that his historical risk factors do not suggest he's at high risk for papillary carcinoma. His age suggests if he has a papillary carcinoma, his prognosis may be more limited than if he were a young female. I, I guess I would want to look at the ultrasound. I think the one exception to not biopsying this, which is totally not worth biopsying based on ATA criteria, uh, would be if it was a posterior lesion and there was some risk of nerve invasion, uh, which can be present even in a microcarcinoma. If it was solidly encapsulated within the thyroid, uh, then I wouldn't uh, biopsy it. Claudio? Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> and the other, the other thing I, I like to add is the location within the thyroid lobe. So if this is uh, located near the superior thyroid pole, at least in our experience, sometimes uh, the chance of malignancy is even higher. Okay, so everybody can read as well as I can. In terms of evaluating patients, and we have, uh, again, the memorial group to thank for, for, to thank for, for bringing this to our attention, are risk factors. There are patient risk factors, tumor risk factors, and imaging risk factors. 
So clearly this man has age and gender as well as imaging risk factors that lead us to malignancy. Now, Brian brought up an interesting concept about leaving this thing. In North America, what do you guys think? Uh, would patients tolerate leaving a, a cancer that's been proven or highly suspicious of cancer? Brian? I've come across perhaps one or two people in America who would be willing to tolerate what they think is a cancer in their neck and just observe it, but they are few and far between. So the key is if you are willing to biopsy this thing to prove it's cancer, you have to be willing to take that patient to the operating room. So if this was your 89-year-old grandmother, you might want to think twice about it. In the 55-year-old guy, when you do the biopsy and prove that this is cancer or suspicious for, he's going to go to the OR almost certainly. Greg, what about a uh, Boston patient uh, with a known cancer? Would they tolerate observation? No, I think as you're bringing up that the strategic point is deciding when to holster your biopsy gun and when to take it out. R once the biopsy is done and positive, it's difficult to backtrack and talk a patient out of surgery. So we looked at a number of risk factors because what I wanted to do a few years ago is create an algorithm or a checklist about risk factors that would lead us to make better decisions about operating. So we found that gender, I'm sorry, that age was a major factor in uh, determining whether or not we should go forward for risk of malignancy. Clearly cervical adenopathy and vocal cord palsy are uh, very significant risk factors. Size didn't come out as a risk factor, oddly enough. Ultrasound, whether or not it was solid or cystic, was a risk factor. But microcalcification clearly was a risk factor, and of course, fine needle aspirate results uh, especially those that came back as atypical, malignant, or suspicious is a, is a major risk factor as well. Most of our pathology departments, cytopathology departments, use the NCI or Bethesda classification, and it's much like our old classification, but our, our malignancy rate was somewhat different when we had a follicular lesion of undetermined significance or atypia. We had a 56% rate of malignancy. The Bethesda group had 5 to 10%. Suspicious was 50 to 75. Ours was, as I said, about 95%. We then looked at the feature of microcalcification as it applied to atypicality and how it could help us in making a, um, a better decision about whether or not to proceed. So it flushed out at about a p-value of 0 0.04. Uh, the odds ratio with microcalcification nodal size of having malignancy is, is as you note. So we constructed this algorithm, and just to take you through, say, one limb of this algorithm, a patient presents with a thyroid nodule. If they had a vocal cord paralysis or regional adenopathy, 100% of those had cancer. But if we go up, say, to a solid nodule with calcification, if they have a fine needle aspirate, even if it's benign, the chance of that patient having cancer with microcalcification and a benign biopsy is about 80%. So I think the take-home message here is stippled calcification, beware of malignancy. So papillary thyroid cancer shows up on this FNA. Now what would you do, Lauren? Well, as assuming that it was a high-quality ultrasound, there was nothing on the other side, there was no significant adenopathy, I, I think that for a six-millimeter papillary carcinoma hemithyroidectomy for me would be adequate therapy. Okay. 